Well, listen, my friends, we don't often think this way because it's probably not popular, but it is accurate. And that is submission. Just the word causes people to just, you know, get intense submission. But wait a minute, we are submitted to the laws of driving cars or to getting on or off an airline or whatever it might be. We are always in a state of submission to those that are in leadership over us. Uh, but what about God in your life and in my life? And what about God in America? Now listen, America without God would make it just like any other nation. But America with God, well, listen, history is written about that. How can we be the light of the world, for example, if we don't include God in our nation's dealings? We have fallen very far, my friends, as a church and as a nation when it comes to shining the light of God's truth. God started this great nation upon his word. History demands that if we would only stop, take a look and listen. So listen, right now, I think you're gonna be super blessed. We're gonna have a sit down with my good friend, Eric Metaxas. Now, Eric Metaxas is a profound author, talk show host, thought influencer, and so much more. So listen, welcome to this very special, special gathering with Eric Metaxas. So Eric, if somebody's watching right now or somebody is here right now, they're thinking you graduated from Yale. You should know that there's a separation of church and state. What would you say to somebody who would, who would say well, the church needs to stay in its box? Right. We got to be real clear. The idea of the separation of church and state was put in place by the founders of this nation to keep the government, to keep the state out of the church's business. Now, that's not my opinion. That's, that's not your opinion. It's not my opinion. This is what every single one of the founders understood, that you cannot have real freedom, you cannot have a people who govern themselves unless they are free to believe as they like, whether they like. If you wanna be an atheist, you wanna be a Buddhist, yep. you wanna be Christian, whatever, the government has zero right to bother you about that. Any more than they can tell you what car you need to drive or whatever it was, the government has According to our founding documents, according to the founding vision of this nation, it must keep away from those issues and allow the people themselves to decide. Yeah. So every other country that, that we had fled you know, from, from, from Europe, they had no separation of church and state. You know, if, you go to, if you go to that, uh, if, you're, if you're part of that country or, or whatever, everybody goes to that church. Uh, or everybody That's goes to right. that church, or you know, or you see this, or you, everybody goes to is, is Muslim, or everybody is atheist. If you're North Korea, or everybody, everybody, America, they said we are going to have religious liberty, and they understood that that undergirds all of our liberties. They they knew this. This is like math. This is not opinions, folks. This is this is the key. Like you cannot have American style liberty and self government unless you have actual liberty, particularly with regard to religious liberty, that, that the government cannot tell you what to think, cannot tell you what to believe, and it definitely cannot like get involved in your, whether you go to church or how you go to church or where you go to church. Like This is utterly, utterly foundational. But at the same time, all of the founders understood if most people don't have some religious faith, right. we can't force it, but if they don't have it, we're not gonna have virtue we're not gonna have people who can govern themselves. So there's like a conundrum at the heart of the founders said, freedom, religious freedom is, 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 is sacred. We're going to have religious freedom. We're not gonna tell people they need to believe in God. We're not gonna tell people they need to go to church. We're not gonna, we have no business doing that. But if they don't do it on their own, our liberties will evaporate. So this was this risk. That's, it's, it's at the heart of all liberty. And, and we always knew that as a people, right? We knew that as, as, as Americans, that we, nobody's gonna force you to go to church, but we believe in God, we respect God. We have presidents like Theodore Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln and every single president. They understood this is the foundation. We can't force it on anybody, but without this, we're not America. This is what makes us free. So that kind of shifted in the 60s and you get 
you know, a, a lot of people under, misunderstanding this, like willfully, basically. Yeah. And basically saying, oh, separation of church and state, that means we've got to remove any religious stuff out of the culture. And it doesn't say separation of church and culture. It's a separation of church and state. In other words, the government cannot officially establish a religion. You all need to go to this church or everybody in this state needs to go to that church, whatever. But, but somehow, uh, Richard John Newhouse wrote a book in 1984 called The Naked Public Square, talking about that we're, we're trying to strip the public square of any trappings of religion, which is the opposite of what the founders wanted. The founders <laughs> knew that if we don't have a lot of religious people in this country, we're not gonna have freedom. So all of the founders understood this, but roughly since the 60s, a lot of our cultural elites have, have turned it around and made it sound right. as though we've got to take God out. And they are undeniably wrong. These ideas have come into the church yeah. where people in the church think, well, I can have my private faith or I can have my faith in my church and you wanna, we need to understand like, no, 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 no. That's not what the Bible says, and that's not what our founding documents say. Our founding documents say, if you have a faith, you can exercise it freely, you cannot be prohibited from exercising your faith anywhere you go, and by the way, God gave you your faith Amen. to take it with you out of the church building and into right. every sphere in the culture. That's, That's right. the point of your going to church is you learn stuff and you take it out and you apply it out there. I think it's very clear in, in archaeology, sociology, just psychology, and of course theology, that all men, I say that men and women, mankind, believe in something. There is no true atheism. Right. It's impossible. Everyone believes in something. Somebody might pride themselves tonight in saying, well, you silly little Christians, I'm an atheist. That's your religion. Yeah. Everyone's got a religion. And you're going to live it out if you really believe it. So we look around at the world right now, and the world is doing tonight, today, what it is supposed to do when it believes what it believes apart from God. They are very committed evangelists, are they not? They're evangelizing your children right now in school. They're evangelizing you through the LA Dodgers. They're evangelizing you through Target. They're evangelizing you through Kohl's, the media, commercials. Constantly, the pulpit of their belief system is bold and it's vibrant and it's, in, it's you know, in the words of, again, Gavin Newsom, it's coming if you like it or not. Well, Imagine if we stood up and said, here's the gospel. What's amazing to me is our gospel invites you, the gospel of God. I shouldn't say our, our gospel is that we follow his gospel, which invites you to experience forgiveness, invites you to have your sins forgiven, and invites you to have eternal life. It's an invitation. It's not tyrannical. Right now, if you say something about gender to government to Biden to Trump, to whatever it might be, whatever the thing is, fireworks go off. Christianity invites you to know God. Our founding fathers, Eric pointed this out, it's brilliant. When you study these guys and read their own mail, I really recommend, get books that have been written by them. You can do that. Do it. Why not just go straight to their mailbox and read it? When you read what they believed, and even those that we would say, well, we don't know if they're evangelicals. Listen, even those who we would say are not our flavor still said that the best thing for America is for people to obey God. Every single one of them. This is incredible. The ones that we think of as somehow, you know, enlightenment, rationalist, like ungodly, whatever... To total baloney. Every oh. single one of them, Benjamin Franklin at the top of the list, knew that if, if people believe in the God of the Bible, uh, they are going to be able to govern themselves and have liberty. They knew, like it's math, there's no way you can get real liberty, real freedom, real self-government, unless people have faith. Every one of them uh, didn't just believe it, but encouraged it. Uh, Franklin encouraged it. So this is part of the warp and woof of w what it is to be American, whether you like it or not. Now again, you can't force people, and our, and our, and our laws are never supposed to force people. You can't force no. people to believe. 
But the fact of the matter is that the founders understood that without this, you can't have America. And so the reason we have drifted to where we are now, this is apart from the, the church's silence, okay? But I'm saying the reason we've drifted is because as you take God out, what is replaced mm -hmm. is satanic. There's no neutral. We've been fooled into thinking, well, yes. we're neutral. Secular is neutral. But if you really look at it, you cannot be neutral. Listen, if you don't believe in the Bible, let's say you just say, oh, I just believe in science, I just believe in evolution, okay? Then you tell me, why is racism wrong? Based on science, now people go, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Of course it's wrong. Yeah, yes, it's wrong, tell me why. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know it's wrong because everywhere in the Bible it says God's no respecter of persons, he loves us equally. In other words, it's a biblical idea that we're all equal. But science tells us, well, we've evolved. Some people might be more evolved than others. And the eugenics movement yes. in this country, uh, which the Nazis borrowed From when they wanted to kill Jews, they yes. borrowed it, Margaret Sanger, whatever, the eugenics movement, they said, this is science. Science says that some groups are more evolved than others. So when you take God out, you, divide, you can't even say racism is wrong. But notice that people aren't talking about that. They kind of act like, what are you talking about? Critical race theory. Critical race theory is founded on uh, its cultural Marxism. It's absolutely. And, and it's total gobbledygook, and it's ultimately racist. It has no basis even on which to say race is wrong. So we're living in a time where we need to know what we believe, and we need to live out our faith, and we need to tell people the truth that apart from the God of the Bible, we don't have the possibility of freedom, we don't have the possibility of eradicating racism or any bad thing. And so the, the church, rather than be bold, we've kind of, as I say, we've retreated and retreated. And we've been silent in the face of evil because we bought the lie. And you think, where does that come? That's not even a biblical idea. What are you talking about? If slavery is on the docket and you're voting, would you say, look, well, I don't want to take a... I don't, from my pulpit, I don't want to lose my 501c3 status, so I'm not going to take a, <laughs> a position on slavery. If you don't take a position on slavery, you're a pig. How, what kind of Christian would you be if yeah. you would not say that is evil from the pit of hell? Right. And it was Christians who led the battle That's right. for abolition of the slave trade, who led the battle of abolition of slavery. It was Christians who led all those battles because they knew from the word of God this is wrong. And... We're living at a time when, when, when people don't want to talk about that. And they want to say, well, we, we, we don't think you should be political in churches. Listen, folks, if we don't live out our faith in every sphere, including the political, satanic values replace it. Yeah. And that is what is happening now. It is only when the church lives out its faith and understands that it is our duty before God to live out our faith in every single sphere and to push back yes. hard against the evil that is all around us, against the bad ideas that are all around us. Why do we push back? We push back because God commands us to love our neighbor. And if you love your neighbor, you will advocate for the truth. You will speak out against the transgender madness because lives are being destroyed and God holds you responsible as the church. You need to speak up against that. That's there are right. parents that they don't know what to think, they don't know what to do. The church needs to be a strong voice. I mean, I thought of this earlier this morning. What could be possibly clearer than he made us male and female in his image? image. We are the image bearers of God. The Bible tells us that God has stamped, he's placed eternity in your hearts. That's why atheists struggle at night when they lay their head down at night. Look, Christian, you lay your head down at night and you fall asleep. An atheist lays down at night and says, man, I hope God's not real. I, I hope he's not real. Because listen, he, he's going up against the witness of the Holy Spirit for one thing. He's like knocking on his head saying, I'm, I'm here, I can hear you. Uh, but that's a tough way to live. But the, the fact of the matter is that we who believe in God, um, it's funny, what drives us, I guess, to be such a problem to an unbelieving culture now is that we, we actually love them. We love the people that hate us, which is a miracle. Come on, let's be honest. We weren't always Christians. Do you remember? I remember when I wasn't a Christian. Um, I, I hurt people that hated me. <laughs> Seems normal to me. Um, then I became a Christian, and, and the big shock to me was I started loving people that I couldn't stand. And it's like, what is going on here? 
and this is God taking over your life. Something or someone's going to take over your life. And we will risk our own safety for our enemy to hear the gospel, not to bend their arm into heaven. Thus, there's no state church. Thus, there's no man, mandatory belief. This is not Islam. Believe or your head comes off. What kind of a deal is that? God is so amazing, the God of the Bible, that he invites you to make a willful decision to love him because he's a real personality. If somebody puts a gun to your head and says, uh, we're going to have sex right now because I've got a gun to your head, that's not love. Or if somebody says, I'm going to control you for my gratification, that's not love. That's animalistic tyranny. God invites you. And here we are in a culture right now. They hate us, like it was said of George Whitfield. It said that he loved the world that hated him. And George Whitfield's greatest passion was that people would be saved. And so we want to announce to the world the gospel. But, we're, but Satan doesn't want that to be said. And so the silencing, the canceling, and all these kinds of things going on. But Eric, what would you say to this? When I, I, was, I thought when I was reading Roosevelt there that I could just see uh, if this was like a Facebook post and people are commenting, oh my goodness, there they go. Nash, what's it called? Christian nationalism. <laughs> Christian <laughs> right. nationalism. You know, it's so, because people are well, saying that like a parrot and they don't even know what they're talking about. First of all, anytime anybody uses the phrase Christian nationalism, like laugh in their face and walk away quick. Because it's so stupid. It's like somebody says, I think you're racist, or I think they're using a term designed specifically to shut you up. They yeah. do not, they're not interested in what you have to say. So they're using this as a cudgel just to beat you into silence. And you need to, Christians, you know, it says, be wise as serpents. It doesn't say be wise as doves. Did you know that? But we sometimes allow the enemies of God to play games with us. And we answer fools according to their folly. We cast our pearls before swine. Our time and our energy is God's time and energy. And you should never argue with somebody who is not interested in the truth. Amen. Walk away. Because that, pray for them, but don't argue with somebody who simply wants to shut you up. And right now, a lot of Christians think that like there's one Christian value. It's being nice. And, and I have to tell you that, that, that that's not a biblical value, folks. Sometimes speaking the truth um, is what God is, is calling us to do. And when we don't do it, when lies are being promoted in the culture and we are silent, the Lord is holding us accountable because we are to be the voice for the voiceless. So whatever you're talking about, whatever issue there is, when we say, well, I don't want to be divisive, Folks, God does not call us not to be divisive. Now, he doesn't call us to be divisive, but the point is it shouldn't be whether you're divisive or not divisive. There are people outside this building, there are people out in the world who don't know God who are depending on those of us who know the truth to advocate for the truth, to advocate for the truth in the public square to make noise when people are lying, when there is corruption. I don't care what the issue is. You pick the most controversial issue, election fraud, uh, vaccine mandates. In other words, it doesn't even matter what you think about that. The point is, when somebody tells you, you can't talk about that, you say, excuse me, excuse me. I'm a Christian. I could talk about anything I want because I don't even fear death, number one. Now, a lot in the church are being shamed by non-Christians who are saying, I can say whatever I want because I'm an American. Patriots died so that I can talk about whatever I want. I don't need anybody's permission because I'm an American. These, these things are enshrined in our founding documents. But the church has been complicit in its own silencing, in its own marginalization. Right now, today, we have people in church life who will say, Eric, Jack, just calm down because God is sovereign. Right. And, you know, I'm just going to trust in the Lord. Listen, when you t of course God is sovereign, but you shouldn't say that 
the way that you mean it, because it's actually heresy. Well, it's actually it's uh, it, it's it's a call to inaction, right? Yeah, it says it, do nothing it's false doctrine. because God is sovereign. You can wait, 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 wait. Like I mean, you, you know, uh, George Washington, uh, when he was fighting, kind of knew in the natural that they would not succeed in the natural. That's right. But if the Lord was with them, that if they really fought, they might have the victory. So amazing? they fought because they thought if God wants us to win, we will fight and the Lord will do what the Lord's going to do. To counsel someone like God is sovereign, therefore George Washington, sit down, we would never have this nation. And there are many voices in the church today saying, just don't just, do anything or, you know what, it's already lost. So just don't do anything. Don't bother. Don't bo if you don't bother, you're helping it be lost. God calls us to fight until he decides when the battle is over. Well, listen, it's obvious, is it not, that first of all, faith is a verb. It demands action. And so God made you and I with the ability to live out our faith. Faith is to be active everywhere, my friend. Don't say that you have faith and you've got no action behind that faith. And this is a wake up call right now to the Christian in America, or for that matter, a Christian in any country where you may be living. And that is the church needs to wake up and get back to biblical truth. And when we do that, it's gonna radically change the complexion of your home. It's gonna change your attitude. It's gonna change your relationship with your neighbors. It's gonna change the way and where you live for God's glory. It is, listen, past time for you and I to get serious about God. So to help you walk with God like never before, please friends, listen. Visit us at jackhibbs.com. We would love to hear back from you, by the way. Just let us know that you're listening. That's one of the greatest things you can do is to say, hey, I'm here, I'm watching, I'm listening. And listen, apart from that, you can tell others to watch and listen as well. jackhibbs.com. Again, as always, you can connect with us at Facebook or Instagram. But by all means, let's connect and let's all make sure that you and I are living out our faith in a way that is vibrant active and engaging. There's no excuse. Let's live it. You are watching Real Life with Jack Hibbs. In 1755, George Washington described how he survived an intense battle completely unscathed with four bullet holes through his coat, two horses shot from under him, and the death of his companions on every side, his life was supernaturally preserved by God. This astounding miracle is just one of 50 found in Susie Federer's riveting book, Miracles in American History. Throughout our history, God has intervened in ways that can only be described as miraculous. Read about 50 such times when inexplicable events turned out to be God's unique blessing on the American people. From the Revolutionary War to the Apollo 13 space mission, find out how God's mercy and the prayers of His people have altered the path of history. Receive Miracles in American History by supporting Real Life Ministries today. To get your copy, visit jackhibbs.com. Select the QR code or call 877-777-2346. Order now. Life is full of fear, doubt, and worry. The more you listen to and see the world today, the easier it is to feel hopeless and helpless. Amidst the confusion, a voice of hope has emerged. The Real Life Network. Founded by Jack Hibbs, the Real Life Network is a free digital media platform, void of the noise of secular media that attack people of faith. Click on the QR code or sign up for free at reallifenetwork.com. Fast forward your faith. In recent events of these last several years, many people have cut ties with church. Some for good reason, but far too many people who know God, and that might be you, who are on their way to heaven, no longer fellowship among God's people. The church today needs to stand like never before. That's why I'm inviting you to join me Friday night, September 8th at the Honda Center in Anaheim, California for a night of just church calling the believer home.
Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history, which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? We ask that you commit to support Real Life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.